Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming for our first Stories That Inspire. I want to share a little bit about the Women's Center. So my name is Eva Berto, and I'm the director of the Women's Center at Bristol Community College. And we have a series that is just really an opportunity to hear someone's story and see the connections that we can make with that. And today we have Dean Shauna Howell, and she's going to be sharing her story. But I also want to let you know that the Women's Center is located in the Fall River campus in the E Building E104, and it's a space where students can come and feel connected and supported. And one of our um, pillars of the Women's Center is really bringing advocacy and a voice to students, so we try to do that in different ways. We're doing that by starting a parenting club, which is going to meet this Wednesday, October 2nd, for the first time. And we're also collaborating with the One Book for the college, The Hate You Give. And on November 13th, here at the New Bedford campus, we're going to have a Women of Color panel to talk about that book and some of the themes that are having there. There's more events, so you should please like us on Facebook and go to our Women's Center page. But without further ado, thank you for having us. And thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a very small and intimate group, and I can appreciate that. So I do um, plan on kind of giving you my story, and then please do not hesitate to ask questions. Um, I, when I talk about myself, it's kind of weird to have to talk about yourself. It's, it's kind of like when you're interviewing and they're like, well, tell me about yourself. <laughs> you never know where to start and, wh and where to end exactly. Um, but let me kind of tell you um, where I started. I was mentioning earlier that I was actually born in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and at about, when I was about eight years old, um, my mother decided that um, where we lived in Mattapan was getting pretty bad. Um, and she wanted a better life for not just myself, um, but my other siblings. Um, I am the fifth child out of six children. So I have a lot of older brothers and sisters, and I had an older brother who was about 14 at the time. And my mother, he began to get in trouble. And my mother decided that, let's go to Atlanta, because at that time, a lot of African-American blacks were migrating to the South for um, more opportunities, um, supposedly better life, um, and so forth. And I say supposedly, and you'll know why um, here in a second. And so um, just a few years before that, my parents had divorced, and my mom um, decided to pack us up and um, move to Atlanta, Georgia. So imagine being an uh, African-American girl uh, with a very funny accent. So when I first moved to Georgia, you know, people, you know, taught, you know, would tease me about my accent. Um, and they would say things like, you think you're white? Which I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> I don't understand that. But my accent, of course, was no, sounded nothing like what, what they, um, what, what they sounded like. So at eight years old, I purposely began to speak like my peers, right? I, I wanted to assimilate into the culture that I was living in. Um, and I began to, mimic my friends and the mimicking eventually henceforth my accent I, I talk now and people where are you from you're not from here um it's it's kind of never gone away uh and so when i moved to georgia we we moved to an area that um was very diverse um it was um, a place where my mother felt like um, we could have a better life. And unfortunately for my brother, that didn't happen. Unfortunately for my family, it didn't happen. Um, when we lived in Boston, we um, owned our home. We had a very nice house. Um, when my parents were together, they were very well off. My older siblings had tennis lessons and piano lessons. And I remember my mother telling me the story of how one day when everybody used to receive paper checks, um, she went, cleaned a purse out and found one of my dad's checks that was about to like expire um, and they never missed it. So they were doing very well off. Well, um, that opportunity of moving to Georgia, which my mother thought would be a better opportunity for us, um, we found ourselves being um, living, we were poor. Um, my father, unfortunately, was no longer involved in our lives. Um, we were on free and reduced lunch. Um, there were times where our um, electricity would get cut off. There were times where um, friends would bring uh, gallons of water over because our water was turned off. Um, I remember my mother coming to us one day, sitting us down, letting us know that we would no longer have a car because they was going to get repossessed, which at the time I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that we no longer were going to have our Delta 88 that I love so much <laughs> um, and love riding in. <clears throat> so for, for the, the younger three in my family, 
our life was very different than our, our older siblings. Our older siblings lived a totally different life for us. Um, and um, when I think about my childhood, um, I was, when, I, when I go and talk to young people, I talk to them about back in the day, if you were on free and reduced lunch, you would have a special card. So your card would be a different color than everyone else's card, right? So if you pay for a full lunch, um, your card would be one color. If you, pay, if you have reduced lunch, your card would be a different color. Then if you have free lunch, it would be another color. So there are three different colors. And we would always have the reduced or the free lunch. Um, and I remember one year, my mom um, came to us and said, your brother, my older brother, was going to start paying. Part of his rent was going to be to pay for our lunch, which it was only 20 cents, right? So it was 20 cents to pay for our lunch because my mom couldn't afford to give us 20 cents to pay for our lunch. And at that time I didn't, you know, in my mind it was, it, it was, it blew my mind that my mom couldn't afford to pay basically 60 cents a day um, to pay for our lunch. But as an adult, I realized like that, that was really hard for her. Um, I tell people all the time, I remember um, when we were on free lunch, I loved it because we could get breakfast and lunch every day. Like that was a big deal. We walked to school and I, my brother and my little sister and I would make sure we got dressed every day. My mom would always leave before we would go to school. She would wake us up and then leave because um, she had to catch the bus and the train. And I rem remember us every Monday morning, we would be so excited because we knew that we were going to have breakfast and lunch every day. And now as a, as a grown up, as an adult, I sit back and I think about how sad is that, that it was, I was excited on Monday mornings to make sure I had breakfast and lunch. Now my mom did the best that she could and I tell people all the time, she's the strongest person I know. I remember at about 12 years old, she would sit me down and pull out all the bills in her checkbook and, and, and kind of say, so Shanna, how do I pay my bills? This is how much money I have and these are the bills that I have. And I, I can remember thinking, you don't make enough money. <laughs> you know, like, what's wrong with your paycheck? Something's not right here because you don't make enough money to cover our bills. And so as an adult, again, I, look, I reflect back and say, well, that's why she couldn't afford 60 cents a day to pay for our lunch for school every day. So um, we were very fortunate that um, no, I didn't know we were poor, right? I didn't realize that this wasn't normal to go shopping at the thrift store in the Goodwill. I thought going shopping at the thrift store in the Goodwill was like, a good thing, it was a great thing, because my mom would make an adventure out of it, right? She would say, let's go and find as many items with, with the tags still on them. So, you know, if you can, if, if someone turned in, we would go to like the nice areas in Atlanta. So my mom would take us to the nice areas and we would go to those Goodwills and those um, uh, thrift stores because, you know, people who had money, they would just give away stuff that had tags on them. So I still love thrift stores and Goodwills because, you know, I just love them. But I remember being a kid and going, I want things from The Gap. And my mom would say, okay, let's see what we can find for The Gap on this Saturday. And so literally I would go through tons and tons of shirts and pants and slacks that, and try to find something with Gap. I remember one day I found some new shoot brown loafers from The Gap. I thought I was the coolest person in the world because I had Gap shoes and they were brand new. I'm like, how would somebody just get rid of these brand new shoes? Um, and so that, that kind of gives you an idea of what my life was like. Um, so I have a, a little video, um, not video, but I have some slides. This is to kind of help you um, to get to know me a little bit. Maybe I'm not doing it right. Or maybe I do it that way. Oh, maybe if I turned it on. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have started off by saying if you are um, a social media person and you want to take a picture or two or snap something I say, my Instagram is um, Dr. Shanna Says and my Twitter is Bristol NB for New Bedford Dean. So please hit me up on your social media. So um, in this picture, I always, every time I do a presentation about myself, I show this picture and I always ask people, um, do you see me in this picture? Can you find me? in this picture. Are you sitting in the back in the chair? <laughs> yep. Really, that's you? So a lot of times when I show this, when I show this picture, a lot of people, they guess other people. They're like, oh, is that you right here in the front? Or is that you with the bull's jacket on? And I'm like, nope, nope, that's me in the back. Um, when, this is seventh grade, so about 12, 13 years old. This is 
this was me. This I was a person who sat in the background. I, I um, um, did not have a relaxer in my hair. So, you know, a lot of us with kinky curly hair, you know, we would get relaxers. And my friend Nicole, good in the bulls jacket, she always would get a relaxer. And I was so jealous of her because my hair would get really poofy and I, I couldn't understand why my mom wouldn't let me get a relaxer. I wore glasses back then. What you can't see is that um, I basically haven't grown in height since that, that time. So I haven't grown since I was about 12 or 13. So I was very tall um, and I, t I often um, would kind of pull back. I wouldn't want to be in the front of people. You would have never been able to tell, tell me that I would stand here or sit here and talk to in front of a crowd because that just wasn't my personality. Um, I always wasn't the smartest person in the room and I tell people to this day, I may not always be the smartest person in the room, but I'm going to be the hardest working. That was just kind of what I learned from my mother um, who was very intelligent. Um, so this was seventh grade and I show this because um, I think about my life at that time and how different who it, it was and what my life is like now um, and how my experiences have truly created the person who I am. So in eighth grade, um, my mother on one Friday, who my mother was a person that um, never was sick, right? So she was a person that I used to think, I, when I think about it, I don't even remember my mom really having a cold. And I remember one Friday, um, January of my eighth grade year, my mother um, was home when we got home from school, which is not normal. So um, usually what my mom would say is, she would leave me a note and say, before you leave, take out the chicken, take out the beef, take out the whatever. And so I did that every morning and um, I would have to prep it. So if we were having spaghetti at night, I would have to ground the, the meat or um, you know, maybe season the chicken or whatever it may be for her to, when she got home. So when we got home um, that particular Friday, my mother was there in the bed and we we're like, oh my goodness, what is wrong with you? She was just like, oh, they say I had the flu. And we we're like, oh, okay, that's, that's really weird. So all weekend my mother was sick and um, my brother and sister who tend to be brats to me, um, behaved extremely horribly that weekend. I remember calling my second oldest sister in Philadelphia and saying, you need to get your brother and sister because Ma is sick and they're acting up, you know, and I'm trying to cook, you know, I'm being a responsible one. And she talked to them on the phone and she told them that, you know, Ma is sick, you need to, you know, act right and this, that and the other. That Sunday night, we went to bed like normal. We woke up on Monday morning. My mother, there was no note for me to, to, to take out any meat. We, we just assumed my mom forgot. And uh, some days she would remind us to go to to wake up and go to school some days we would just wake ourselves up so we just figured it was one of those days where my mom was gonna um we were just gonna wake ourselves up so we all went to school and i remember getting to school and um getting called to the principal's office which i was a good kid so in my mind i'm thinking why am i getting called to the principal's office and when i get there it was my one of my mom's best friends who we call aunt margo aunt margo was on the phone letting us let me know that my mom was in the hospital wasn't quite sure what was going on um, little did we know my mom had been, um, my aunt uh, Margo picked her up in the middle of the night while we were asleep and took her to the hospital because my mom just was so sick that she, she felt like this was more than the flu. So because I was only 13 years old, my brother at the time was 16 and my little sister was nine, um, they didn't feel like they needed to keep us abreast of what was going on. So that was Monday. Um, Tuesday, uh, Monday my mom's friends came over and took care of us. Tuesday my older sister. Um, who had just gotten married two months before, um, drove up from Savannah, Georgia, and stayed with us and was going back and forth to the hospital. That Saturday was my first basketball game um, ever, and I was so excited, and I wanted to tell my mom, and so everyone, um, someone brought me to the hospital. That was my first time seeing my mom in almost a week, and we were able to see her, and at that time is when we found out she was diagnosed with cancer. Her cancer was so aggressive that at that point, there was really nothing that they could do for my mom. So this is Saturday. I'm excited. I'm telling my mom about my basketball game and how great I did. I really didn't do that great, but in my mind, I felt like I did. Um, and I was telling her and she just kept saying, that is so good, Shanna. That's all she kept saying. That is so good, Shanna. That is so good, Shanna. 
Sun, uh, we went home Saturday, Sunday morning at a probably about four or five o'clock in the morning. My older cousin Frank came to the house and said, get dressed, we're going to the hospital. So we get to the hospital. Um, sorry, that was Monday, Monday morning, four, four o'clock in the morning. My cousin brings us to the hospital. We see my mom at that time. She had tubes running from everywhere. She could no longer talk. The only thing she could do was blink her eyes. So we would say like, Ma, I love you. And she would blink her eyes. We would say, um, you know, whatever we would say, she would blink her eyes. That was our only way of communicating with us. So after a few minutes, my cousin Frank said, aren't you guys hungry? Well, I was greedy at that time and I, well, I still am. Um, I love food. So my cousin said, let's go get some breakfast downstairs in the, in the food area. So of course the three of us were kids, we're hungry. Sure, let's go. We go downstairs, we eat breakfast. Um, by the time we got back, um, they informed us that our mom had passed away. So at 13 years old, 14 days before my 14th birthday, the woman who had been everything to me, the woman who had taught me everything that I knew, um, was no longer with us. My father was not in my life at that time. We had not seen him probably in about eight years at that point. So then we're at, at 13, almost 14 years old, trying to figure out, well, where do we do? Where do we go? What happens now? What, you know, we, we, my brother and I talk about this now, how we weren't even thinking about, like, what adult, we ourselves were trying to figure out how we were gonna take care of ourselves at 13 to 16 years old. But I was very fortunate that my mother had older children and my older sister, who at the time was only 29, about to turn 30 years old, decided that she would take us in. So she took on her 16 year old brother, her now 14 year old sister and her nine year old little sister. At that time, she had already had two children. She was on her second marriage and had a stepson. And so we moved to Savannah, Georgia to a two bedroom apartment, which we lived in the house. My sister and I shared a room. You know, we thought we, thought we were big time, you know, that we, had a, we shared the master bedroom and had a, had a bathroom that we shared. And, and we moved to my sister's house where I slept on the couch every day. Um, but there was so much love in that house. Um, it didn't even matter that I was sleeping on the couch every day. It was just like, I'm with my sister and there's love in this house. And her husband was a great cook. And so we had good food every day and we lived in Savannah and it was seafood and I was happy. And so we finished out that school year. My, my sister decided, you know, thankfully, though my mom didn't have a lot of money, she put a lot of money into life insurance. Mm -hmm. She did. So my sister was able to move us back to the house that we had been in for so many years, had grown up with. Um, we were able to um, go back to school with the friends that we had known forever. Um, and we, I graduated with the people I, I knew for a, a good majority of my life. But I was that kid in high school that um, I was very popular. Um, I was uh, involved in every club, um, was, um, you know, people thought, oh, Shanna has a great future ahead of herself. But I personally didn't believe that I could go to college because no one in my family had gone to college. Um, my older sister kept saying, you know, she had several scholarships offered to her. She, my sister is very, very, very intelligent, but she got pregnant at 17 and had my nephew. Um, and so she never, she never went to school. So around my 11th grade year, um, I was very involved with student government. And I tell people all the time, um, Dr. Nancy Mitchell, she is the whitest white woman with red hair from Southern Alabama who was the person who took me under her wing, this little black girl with kinky hair, um, very insecure, very, you know, not sure about my life, where I was gonna go, what I should do. She was a special ed teacher. She had nothing, she really was just the advisor for student government. And she told me, she said, Shanna, you are a bright young lady. You have a future ahead of yourself. And I said, well, how am I gonna do that? She was like, you need to go to college. I said, everybody keeps telling me I need to go to college, but why? Like. Is it really necessary? You know, I, I just, I don't even know if I can do it. She was the person that when I had interviews for scholarships, she would drive me to those. Because my sister, she was working, she was taking care of everyone else, she couldn't do it. Um, and um, Nancy, Ms. Mitchell was just a person who, if she saw any type of potential in you, she really did everything that she could to, to help you. I was, she retired um, three years ago and I did a video for her retirement. And I talked about how when I was graduating, she um, had given a, a friend, of, a classmate of mine $50 for graduation. 
So I thought to myself, well, she gave him 50. I know I'm probably gonna get like 100 because I'm her girl, right? Like I am so excited to, to see what she gives me. And she has me come to her classroom. She gives me this box with a nice bow on it. And I'm like, oh, so I'm getting money and something else. Like I am so excited. So I open up this nice box and take the bow off and I open it up. And it's this beautiful black leather planner. And I'm looking at it like, well, the money must be inside <laughs> of the planner. So I open the planner up and I'm looking through it and shaking it a little bit. And she, she explains to me that, you know, when you go to college, you need to be organized. And she talked about the importance of, you know, planning things and being prepared and, you know, life, things in life happen sometimes and you need to be prepared. And so she, you know, kind of went through time management. I didn't know that then, but she kind of talked about the importance of time management. If you come to my office right now, I still have that planner. And I graduated, I'm not going to tell you when I will. I graduated in the 90s, so I've kept that planner for a very long time. And it's not so much that I use it anymore, but it's very significant to me um, when I think about my life and my career and so forth. So um, it was time to apply for colleges, and um, Nancy said, you know, do you want to go to a big school? Do you want to go to a small school? Do you want to go to a private school? What do you want to do? And I'm like, I don't what are you talking? I have no idea what you're talking about. And I went to my older sister and she said, Shanna, I really can't help you. I don't know, you know, I don't know what's going to work best for you. My biggest thing is that I still had a little sister at home and I didn't want to go too far from home. So thankfully, one of my classmates was like, oh, we're going to go visit um, West Georgia. It's about 45 minutes west of Atlanta. It would be really close to home. Why don't you come, come check West Georgia out? And I said, okay. So Tiffany and I, who's still my friend now, Tiffany and I and a couple other girls, we went out to West Georgia. We did a visit. It was nice. It was beautiful. I'm going to be honest with you. There were boys. And I was like, oh, look at there. What? You know, that really drew me, you know. And so um, I, I decided to, to go to West Georgia. And Tiffany, who was a girl, total opposite of me, she was a white. Her dad was a Southern Baptist pastor. Um, she, I mean, two totally different lives, but she, she and I became roommates um, my freshman year in college. But I always tell people that, you know, back when I was going to college, that's when you still did financial aid paperwork on, on paper, right? So I always remember going to my sister and saying, hey, I need you to fill this out. And she was like, what do you mean? I don't understand. I was like, I don't, all I know is I need your taxes. And she felt very offended, you know. I need your taxes and I need you to fill this out. And she was like, I'll do my best. And she tried to fill it out. And you know, we, back then you didn't have all the resources that you have now where you have organizations that go to communities and high schools and help you fill that out. And so I went back again to Ms. Mitchell, Nancy, and I said, hey, my sister, you know, she did the best that she can. Can you help me fill this out? And she, you know, helped me fill it out. And um, I was able to get my financial aid and, and so forth to go to college. So I tell people, I tell this story all the time because I think it's important to think about, you know, even some of the students that we work with and what, how they're thinking when they go to college. So here I am, first generation. Um, my, you know, mother was no longer living. My father wasn't in my life. Um, I was very, um, I felt like I wasn't smart enough to go to college. I felt like um, that, even though everybody, I thought I was faking it through high school. I thought I was, you know, I put on a good show for people. And then once I got to college, it was like, you can't hide anymore behind you can speak well or you can write well. It was going to be like spotlight on me. And so I remember going to my sister and telling her, okay, um, we move into our dorms on Saturday. And she goes, you better call your brother and tell him to, take his truck and help you move. And so that's exactly what happened. My brother comes to the house, he loads the truck up, he drives me to the school, he brings everything in and he leaves. Everybody else had families who were staying, who were helping them, you know, make their beds up and helping them unpack. And here I am by myself, getting all my stuff together. Um, and I remember him saying, why do you have so many pairs of sneakers? I, back then I was like a tomboy, like I wore a lot of, you know, Jordans and stuff like that. I worked at a shoe store, so, you know, I had a lot of uh, sneakers or whatever. And um, th that experience, again, kind of 
makes me think about our students, right? So a lot of our students are coming to our campuses. They don't have support and maybe their family is there with them, but they can't really tell them what they need to do or how to be successful or um, these are the resources that your college should offer. So go ask someone about that. I was just kind of lost. I was just kind of trying to figure things out on my own. So my first, after my, we were on quarters. My first quarter um, of college, I was on academic probation. They basically told me if I messed up one more semester, I could no longer be in school. Um, they told me if I continue to mess up, I will lose most of my scholarships. In Georgia at the time, we had what's called the Holt Scholarship. If you graduated high school with a 3.0 or higher, your tuition will be paid for at any state institution. So I had the Holt Scholarship. I also had a couple of other different little scholarships. Um, so I had a 1.83 after my first quarter. I lied to everyone and told them that I did really well and I had a 3.0. Um, lied. I mean, just, oh yeah, it was great. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? Like, how am I going to pull my grades up from a 1.83 to get my back to a 3.0? And mathematically, it was just not going to work out. You know, once we, I sat down, um, they made me um, meet with the academic advisor. Like, it was a requirement that if you're on probation, you have to meet with the academic advisor, you have to do these things. Um, and that academic advisor, I tell people all the time, she saved my life. She taught me things that I had never been taught before um, about being successful in college. And so I hate that I was, on, I was on academic probation, but that academic probation is actually what helped me continue to, go, um, to finish school. Because of life, um, I eventually uh, had to sit out of school for a while. Um, during my sophomore year, I actually um, dealt with depression. And, and a lot of people don't know that, but um, I think the reality, after my mom passed, I just kind of just started living life and not really processing things. My sophomore year in college, I was very depressed. I mean, um, I had a roommate and one day I said, I went to her and said, Jessica, do you think I should stay in school or go to work? Um, little did she know I no longer had health insurance. I was no longer covered under my sister. I was concerned about if I got sick, what, what would happen. I needed to pay for school because I no longer had the scholarships. Um, and so I sat out of school. Um, I began working full time for the state of Georgia. I work with adults with developmental disabilities. During that time, I learned a lot. I matured a lot um, and um, really understand when people say they're dealing with depression though mine may not be as bad mine wasn't as bad as me, what many people that we deal with deal with um but it was enough that it really made me realize that okay this is going to affect a lot of my life so i need to do something about it um and i'm glad that i realized that a lot of people don't realize that there's help out there that you need to seek help when um when you are depressed um needless to say um college took took a little while for me. It took me seven years to actually get my bachelor's degree. Um, at some points in my life, I um, would take one class at a time um, for a couple years. I just took one class at a time because again, I was paying out my pocket um, and I was working full time and I was determined to finish, uh, finish my degree. So I finished my degree. Um, at that time, I was a program manager for the, that same program I had been working for. Um, and one day um, I was just, thinking about my life and, and I said, you know, that academic advisor that helped me that, that, that freshman year, you know, she really had a huge impact on my life. I want to do that. I want to help students who are like me, you know, first generation and don't have support maybe at home or maybe have support but not to help them in, um, in their college career. And so I began applying for jobs at the college I graduated from and in my mind I'm thinking why wouldn't they want to hire me? I graduated from here. Not knowing that everybody applies for jobs right at, at their alma mater or whatever. So finally um, an academic advisor job um, opened up and I applied. And I got an interview, which I was shocked because technically I didn't meet the minimum qualifications because you're supposed to have like two years experience and a bachelor's degree. So I asked my boss once I was hired, why did you even interview me? She said, well, I had worked with adults with developmental disabilities for 20 years. And um, I knew if you had patience to work with that populations of individuals, you can work with you know, college students and students on academic probation. And as I walked into the office the first day, I looked at her and said, gosh, this office looks very familiar to me. I can't, why, why does this office look so familiar? And what I later found out is that the academic advisor who had helped me those few years, many years ago had retired and I took her job. 
and I took her office. So for me, it was full circle for me to come back to the same place where I thought my life was over, the same place where I thought they're gonna kick me out of college. I was now helping students in the same predicament because we work with students on academic probation and so forth. So that I love telling that story because you know, in life sometimes we don't always get to come back around to that full circle. We don't always get those opportunities. But my life in many ways, it has presented, um, presented that for me. So um, w one thing that I, I did not talk about um, earlier was um, I, ta I mentioned earlier how we moved from Boston to Atlanta. and My mom um, wanted a better life um, for us. My brother, and he knows I share this story all the time, <clears throat> he is I tell people all the time, he gives me the best advice ever. Like all throughout my life, he is that person who would tell me little things and he, believe it or not, I would listen to him. And, and, and now he's like, why did you listen to me? Like, I was crazy, I was doing this, I was doing bad things or whatever. Why, are you, why, why were you listening to me? And I told him, he was like the father figure in my life. So I would listen to things that he would say. And I remember him saying things like, you need to watch that young lady, she's fast. You know what that means, like, you know, growing up when they say, she's fast, you need, she needs to, you need to watch out for her. She's not good company or whatever. And he will always be right. Um, and I told him, I said, you know, I don't know if I would be the person that I am if he had not spoken into my life on those occasions by saying those little things, even though he thought he was just saying something out the side of his mouth, um, I really listen. And I say that because I always tell people that there's, I feel like that there are people who are placed strategically in your life for different reasons, right? Sometimes we don't pay attention to those little things. Sometimes we don't realize how important it is to really give that person two or three minutes because something they could say could definitely change your life. Um, I don't believe that I would be the person that I am if I didn't have the Nancy Mitchells, my older brother. My older, if my mom hadn't had my sister at 17 years old, I might not, she might not have been able to raise us after my mom passed away, right? So in life, we have to really pay attention to um, people who even want to pour, I'd say pour into your life by telling you these little, give you, giving you these little trinkets. So I have another slide. Um, this, the girl you just saw here, I would have never thought would have ended up here. So this is my, the, uh, the burgundy is my high school graduation picture. Um, as you can see, my hair doesn't change much. I, um, just recently cut my hair, uh, cut five and a half inches off last month before I moved here and everybody was shocked because I literally have kept long hair pretty much all my life. Um, that that there is so much behind those eyes there's so much behind who i was at you know 18 years old graduating from high school i had no idea what i wanted i thought i wanted to be a special ed teacher i went to college on a scholarship um, for special ed um i thought that um i just i didn't i didn't know who i was i was just very lost as far as what i wanted to do in life i do not have my bachelor's um picture because um, the year I graduated finally with my bachelor's degree um, was the year that we, the worst tornado had ever hit Georgia. And so we didn't even have a graduation. We literally went to the room, shook the president's hand and took a picture. I was so distraught and so upset that I didn't even buy my, my graduation pictures. And you know, at that time we didn't have the camera phones and all that that you have, um, that we have now. So I didn't do that. The middle one um, is my for my master's degree, um, and I tell people all the time that um, at that point they had told me that I could never have children, and I I don't know how I got through my master's degree because I was just very depressed. Again, I, it was you know at the point at that time I was actually married, and to be told that you can't have children, um, uh, we tried a fertility treatment and that didn't work. Um, I was a very depressed person, um, but I finished. Somehow, some way, I was able to be resilient and, and, and made it through. Then this last picture is from my, um, when I was um, hooded for my um, doctorate. And um, my son, who they told me I would never have, and who I naturally, <laughs> I got pregnant naturally with no help, 
he was there. I mean, granted, he was only a few months old for my graduation, but he was there. So again, when we talk about full circle, you could have never told that woman in the burgundy that she would one day be Dr. Shanna Howell. And you could have never told the woman in the middle that at her graduation, she would have a child that would be there. Um, so I'd like to share that with people because we, you know, graduations are, are so sentimental. We just think about, you know, going through all those classes. And sometimes when, you, when we're graduating, it's more than just paper and pen and sitting in the classroom. It's life, graduating from struggles, graduating from depression. And I think about the students that we work with. This is what a lot of our students are dealing with. It may not be the same as that story, but when they get that associate's degree, when we, when we send them on to get their, go get their bachelor's degree, we're graduating them to a whole, hopefully a better life, um, overcoming the things that they've dealt with when they were younger, when they were in middle school, when they were in high school, the things they did with while we're on that campus. And those are the things that I think about when I work with, um, with our students. So now, uh, what I do, so when, when I was asked to do this, I was like, sure, this is, I love doing this because one thing I, you know, most of you know, I was in Iowa for 12 years. I went around the middle schools and talked to young people, middle schools and high schools. At any opportunity that I have, um, I had, I would go and talk to young people because especially, the, for instance, this group is seventh and eighth grade girls, right? That time in my life that was just dramatic when I share my story. This group I, I met with in March of this year, and um, usually the group was split up. They usually didn't combine the girls because they said they would be loud and they would be rowdy, and so they would split the group up. Group up. But the day that I, I was presenting, they put the group together, and they said it was the first time that the girls ever got along, that the girls paid attention, that the girls asked questions, and at the end, um, we had tears. There were people crying. This one young lady had just last, lost her father. And so me sharing about my mom passing when I was in um, eighth grade, it really stuck to her. Another young lady had just moved there from Atlanta and she was talking about how the environments are so different and trying to adjust um, um, from one environment to another. And I talked, you know, I talked about my experience of moving from Boston to Atlanta and what that adjustment was. And so I share my story. I tell people all the time, there's not much about me that you can't ask or you can't find out because I think that um, that allows us to be able to relate and it allows people to understand why you are the way that you are. Um, and it also allows us to connect. So that's it. I'll give you guys time to, to ask questions. Well, I, she's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I, I just want to say that that was very admirable. And I think that you, like you said, came full circle. And looking at you and being there, I am so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. When I recently did, um, I portrayed Coretta Scott. Mm. And one of the things that I learned through my research on her was how she got mentored and by the people that mentored her. And in saying that, I think, and I honestly have always felt this way, mentoring is so important, mm -hmm. so key. From the people in the community who have been there, right. or have been through struggles, or whatever, like your brother, mm -hmm. just people to be there for right. individuals. Because mm -hmm. you never know what's going on in mm -hmm. their life. Yep, it's so very important. That's a very good point that you raised as far as Thank your you. family. And Thank, you. Thank you. And I tell people all the time, people always say, well, why do you m m mention that Nancy um, Mitchell is a, a red-haired white woman from Alabama because we were so opposite and 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 people you know some and I do believe I mean I I tell people I had a mentor in college was a girl who looked just like me and that she helped me because I she could relate to me I'm you know where do I get the hair products from right where do I go to get my hair done where do I go to church things of that nature so that was great but we also can you know one of my biggest mentors is a older white gentleman who's been in the field for a very long time and he tells me things that the black woman mentor that I have can't tell me. You know, he'll say stuff like, well, Shannon, I'm going to tell you how a white man looks at you. She can't tell me that, right? So I tell people well, it's important to know that mentors don't always have to look like you. They don't always have to be from the same background as you. I think it helps in some instances when you do have individuals who can guide you, who look like you. 
Um, but they're also, we can learn so much from others as well. And so that's why people are like, why do you always mention that she, I'm like, because she, that's, that's the truth. And she helped me and she didn't have to do that. You know, she didn't, she didn't have to take me under her wing. And it's true. And we need to be open to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes people feel like, well, I'm a person of color, so I don't want to go to that. And that's, that's really not the way it should be. Mm -hmm. we, people are there to offer that. Help. Right. You need to accept it mm -hmm. and, and learn. Right. We're, it's you know it's a global thing right we can't just isolate ourselves just to one group because then we won't know what everybody else is thinking right just right like the gentleman told you mm-hmm yep well I'll share my comments I thought that you your story was really remarkable too and such a great choice that you're now our Dean because you can really relate to our students mm -hmm. and you know, I think of a lot of different things struck to me, you know, having the older brother, too, that sometimes would say things and you feel like you want to knock them out, but they're giving you direction. <laughs> right. You, want, you listen to them. Right. And, you know, I definitely want to share this with the student body, maybe in a separate email, because your story is so valuable. There's so many Thank students you. that can relate to your story. Mm -hmm. First generation. That's yeah. It. Like, I'm here, but I don't really know if this is my place and if I belong. And this is just an mm -hmm. affirmation to say, right. I do belong. Yep. And I tell people. I, I said one day I'm gonna write a book and it's gonna be from probation to PhD, not that kind of probation, <laughs> but academic probation to PhD. Um, and you should. You know, because the, the the truth of the matter is, is that I, I people, are, why do you say you're happy you got on probation? I don't know if I, if if I would have worked as hard. You know what I mean? If I would have, because when they when they threatened me, and he, in my mind, all I could think, you know, in my entire life, I've always thought. I hope I'm making my mother proud, right? And so when I got on academic probation, I thought to myself, she would be so mad. You know what I mean? She would be so upset with me. Now I need to work hard. I need to figure this out. I need to get myself together. But um, just because you start off one way, right? Just because I was on academic probation, like, that was hard. That was a lot. You know, that was, you know I was a student that was in honors and AP classes in high school, right? So the thought of, of receiving a two-point something was you know, blowing my mind, but to have a 1.83 was just like, that's unheard of. This, this is not what Shanna does, you know? Um, but to be able to move from that place to, you know, uh, to, to, to be now Dr. Howe, I mean, you would have never been able to tell me that that would happen. Well, you know, and I'll just share this other point. I was a single, a single parent. I divorced and went back to school. I was determined because I always wanted to go to college. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was my grand. My father went, and he was the first one in our family. Mm -hmm. I knew the importance of that. So I get into school like you. I didn't know who I should talk with. And even though my father was a mm -hmm. scholar and everything, he was doing his life. And I'm like, well, I'm here. What am I going to do? Who am I going to talk to? So I was able to get through the first semester, and I came out with a C. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, oh, this is OK, but it's not what I want because I felt I knew what my with the ability I had to, to get even better. And then, you know, the boy thing, you get involved with somebody, because I was the boss and I started seeing somebody, and I'm just sharing this real quick, that things didn't go right and I really got off track. Mm -hmm. So I dropped out for a semester. Mm -hmm. And then uh, people say, well, you know, once you drop out, you're never gonna go back and all that. And then him and I had some choice words at one point. Mm -hmm. And he said, you'll never amount to anything. I said, you know what? You have been my, my downfall. I said, but I'm gonna tell you one thing. I could have probably made Kuma Kum, uh, Kumadi. Kum, um, mm -hmm. I says, but I'll go back and I have enough time and I will make something out of myself. I will complete it. And I did, I ended up on the Dean's list. Mm -hmm. Left him, went on the Dean's list and graduated with a, um, a 4.0 mm -hmm. at the time from mm -hmm. UMass, but was SMU. And these are the things, you know, you have these setbacks. That right. You don't think you can pick up and go right. forward. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people that, because I go to schools, I've been to schools and, and you know, spoke with class and stuff and I tell them, don't give up. Mm -hmm. I don't care what your setback is. Mm -hmm. Don't give up. Yep. So that is so, you know, like mm -hmm. you say, from probation to, mm -hmm. I didn't get my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. That's all right. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Yes. I have a question. I'm Tom Grady. I teach English primarily here. Um, and, and I agree that your story is, could be a real, um, could save students that if they identify with you and they can see a person like you mm -hmm. be successful. And, and what's so fascinating to me is that some of the, I think it's just great that you have the humility and openness to discuss mm -hmm. your struggles. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are circumstantial that don't have anything to do with you. And some of them are about sort of how you're built. Right. 
Um, but to, but one of the things that I'm really curious about when I think of you talking to students about coming back from being on probation mm -hmm. and walking that walk that mm -hmm. you've done mm -hmm. is slowing the roll, slowing the story down to when you reflect back, mm -hmm. what happened? What happened that, you know, you have this successful student, you know, who's, who's has external struggles of poverty right. and the loss of your mom, et mm -hmm. cetera. And then what happened that the grades stunk so bad at that beginning? You want me to be honest with you? Yeah. I partied. Got it. So I it mean, was, so, yeah. So my freshman year, uh, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, my sister was not strict. Um, she was not, um, I, I, I tell people all the time, she, she, she provided a wonderful home for us. I had food, warm food every day. I had clothes, um, something that I really hadn't done before. She would get my hair done regularly. I mean, because again, my mom le left, left us in a good position, right? And so, but what happened was is that the freedom that I received once I got to college was different than the freedom that I had in high school because now there were parties every Thursday night, right? Um, and I tell people all the time that I had an eight o'clock class on Friday. I did not miss one class, even though I partied almost every Thursday because I was like, I was determined to go to class. Like, I don't want anybody to say, well, she never went to class. I know why she didn't do well. So I still, even though I was doing, th the other thing was is that, um, what I could get away with in high school. So in high school, I could last minute, you know, turn in a paper and write it and the teachers would be like, oh, great job, Shanna. Um, my, that eight o'clock English class on Friday was the chair of the department, which I did not know. He was a scholar in, in English and had written many books and was just probably the worst person for me to take <laughs> my freshman year. Um, um, but it, again, you know, I, I I thought that I would be fine because I was in AP English in high school and, and honors. And, you know, I, I felt like the behaviors that I had in high school, I thought they would work in college. And I quickly found out that they would not work. So procrastination, which we all in some ways deal, still deal with that as adults, but procrastination was probably one of the number one things. The other thing was is that I surrounded myself with people who did really well. So it wasn't like my peers didn't do well and we were all flunking out. They did great. Um, the problem was is that I would not put forth the effort that they were putting forth. So I would say we all would go to study together. I would kind of play around and I mean, I can only imagine students now with cell phone. I mean, we didn't have that, right? I didn't even have my own computer. So we had to go to the library to use the computer and so forth. But I would fiddle around and I'm a doodler. You know, I would doodle. I'm supposed to be reading notes and I'm drawing and I have circles everywhere and flowers. Um, but it, but I, I definitely will say that I probably wouldn't have done as well as I did if I didn't hang with those people, right? If I was just kind of on my own or just hang, I probably would have had all F's. And I didn't have an F, it was just that those D's, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that messed me, mess, um, made my GPA what it was. But definitely um, that behavior, the, those behaviors that I had floated by in high school, literally floated by in high school with ease, that just wasn't going to work. And I realized that. And the other thing is that I did not have the study habits or the, nor the study skills that I needed to be successful in college. You know, in high school, you get a study guide, you read it the night before, you take the test the next day. You can't, that's not going to work in college, you know? So it's a lot of those, those habits and behaviors that I had to change. Um, well, I think, you know, it, it partially <clears throat> that story, when I think about our students, um, and um, relating to them or them relating to you is the habits of mind piece is mm -hmm. something that they could really benefit from. Part of it is sort of being at a residential college mm -hmm. and having like the explosion of freedom. Right. And that they won't relate to. Right. Like, no, I have to feed my kids. Yep. I still have to work. And yep. all that. Yep. But they do, but they would relate to the, you know, I kind of got by at New Bedford High mm -hmm. or at, um, Durfee with seat time. Mm -hmm. I was able to do it with keeping a smile on my face yep. and seat time. Mm -hmm. And now, wow, you know, that uh, That's not it's gonna, on. Right. It's not going to work yep. here because as much as we have really, you know, especially this campus has such hands on, and I hate using this term because it sounds so aggressive, but intrusive um, care. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, advisors will come into my class and say, I'm right down the hall, mm -hmm. I'm right down the hall. Mm -hmm. And they get it and they connect to them, but they're not used to, but y'all have to walk down the hall. Right, exactly, <laughs> yep, yep. So they don't, yep. uh, and sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. But that's why that part of the story I'm mm -hmm. fascinated by because mm -hmm. they can go, and she did it. Mm -hmm. And look where she came, right. even though she didn't have the habits of mind at the time. Right. I can do that too. The other thing, to be honest with you, my problem in college was that I wrote like I spoke. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand the way that I, the way that I talked to my family and my friends that that was not going to be okay in college, right? That um, grammar and whatever you want to call it, you know, um, I couldn't write y'all in my paper, right? I could, there were just ain't. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? There were just certain things that, depending on the subject matter, the subject, um, that I was not able to to write that way, and I had to, you know. Some people, oh, you change it? No, this is, is there's proper English and grammar that you need for um, academia, right? And then when I'm talking to my friends, I talk how I talk to my friends or whatever. But I didn't understand that at first. I mean, because in high school, I felt like. It was okay, right? It was, you know, we were reading a, sto a particular story and it made sense. It was okay for me to write a certain way. Um, but when I got to college, I realized like there's more of a uh, proper way of, of writing, which I, I didn't initially understand. Because when I, when my first paper, when he, he handed it back to me. I thought somebody had died because there was so much red on the paper. Um, and, it, and, and I couldn't understand, but it was because he marked my paper up so much with the red pen, um, a marker actually, it wasn't even a pen. Um, and instead of me saying, um, oh, I need to go to someone to get help, I thought to myself, I can do this myself, right? It was hard for me to ask for help. It was hard for me to, to seek out assistance. And so I tried to figure it out because honestly, throughout my life, that's kind of the behavior I had. I'll figure this out, I'll work it out. And in some ways I'm still like that, but it, it, I definitely learned to um, begin to ask for help a couple of semesters after that. It didn't happen right away, um, but I was used to, you know, Okay, my my sister can't help me with financial aid. Let me go, you know, let me figure out how I ha how how I'm going to take care of this. Or I remember when I first got to college and they were like, "You still have you still owe $1,000." And I was like, "What do you mean? You know, I have all these scholarships. What's going on? Well, let me figure out how I can do this." You know, so when you're kind of in that habit of um, taking care of yourself and and trying to figure things out on your own, it's kind of hard to go and ask somebody to help you um, with this paper with all the red writing on it, you know? Mm -hmm. I think you bring up another important point that many of our students can relate to when you talk about feeling depressed. Mm. Because so often I think, you know, when you come into the college setting, you almost feel like it's compartmentalized mm -hmm. and that there's an outside world and it doesn't clash with this one. Mm -hmm. But it does. Oh, it does, yes. Having that self awareness to say, you know, this, I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you think of, unless I'm taking meds or right. I'm at that level, yep. that's only depression yep. to have that. I think that's important that you were able to see. And, and, and to be honest with you, in many communities, it's not, it, you know, you go pray about it or you you deal with it or, girl, do you know what our people have overcome? You little depression's not going to, you know, you can deal with that. That's something that I'm sure a lot of our students deal with, students deal with because it's like you don't want to tell somebody I'm, I'm feeling depressed or, you know, I just don't feel right or I can't get out of bed, which was never my thing. I, ne I was one of those people like, no one's going to know I'm depressed. So I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to every class, every event, and I'm going to act like everything's okay. But I really, you know, deep down inside, I could, you know, I definitely was depressed. But we also, you know, when we work with our students, who, especially from some cultures where it's not normal to seek out therapy. It's not normal to tell someone you're not feeling okay. You're supposed to figure it out and keep and keep moving. And I think I dealt with that a little bit too because I was at a campus that most of the people didn't look like me, you know, and I'm like, I don't want to go to the counseling center and they're like, well, what's wrong with her, you know? Um, and the counseling center was in a location that people would know you were going there as well, which is very, it's something to think about as well. So I, I really, did, I did. I ended up not going to the actual counseling center. I sought help um, out, outside of the school, but um, that's something else that you know. I'm sure some of our students may be dealing with just that we don't even think about that. You know, at home they can't just go home and say I'm depressed, and people will be understanding and encouraging and telling them where they need to go. So, how did your younger siblings do? 
So um, my my brother who was 16, he was above me and then my little sister. So he and I are the only two with um, college degrees and he has two master's degrees as well. Um, and he is in the military, he's a um, lieutenant colonel, he's done very well, very successful. Um, my other siblings, you know, I tell people all the time I have a PhD, but I have some siblings who make more money than I do, right? Um, but my, I, my siblings and I, we are very close. Um, we text, we have a group text, we text almost every day. We keep in contact with each other. Um, and um, yeah, we, we're, we're very close. I mean, we're just a very close family. I tell people all the time, until I turned 30 years old, I did not realize the sacrifice that my sister made when she took us in. Um, at 30 years old, you're still trying to figure life out. You, you're still, you know, she had children. She had just married two months prior to, and um, it was a lot. And to take on like my mom's bills and then life insurance and, you know, now this mortgage or whatever she had to figure out. I know I couldn't have done it at 30, because when I turned 30, I was like, she did, you know, like, whoa, this is a lot. Hold up, I don't know how she did it. And I'm, I will, I tell people, I, was, I will be forever, forever indebted and grateful to her. I mean, because she did something that most people would not, you know, my grandmother was there like, you're gonna come to Miami with us, this is it, you know, telling us. And it was nice to be able to graduate high school with people I had known for all those years and to, um, you know, to, to be with child, you know, people who, who were in that picture, we graduated together, you know? So that was really nice to, to, to have that consistency, you know, in my life. I needed that at that time um, to still be around my same friends and so forth. We applaud your sister as well. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We wouldn't have you here today. Yeah, so that's, yeah. That's a plus for this school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh. Shannon, I'm super impressed, and I think that you make a great effect on the students because you're so real. You know, Thank you're you. just authentic. Thank you. And you can't fake authenticity. Um, you just be yourself. Mm -hmm. You're telling them being vulnerable. And I think a lot of community college students, a lot of students in general, though, we know are community college students, they definitely have imposter syndrome and don't think that they're ever going to be. So to have a dean, a woman of color that's got a PhD and is real and raw and talking the language that she knows best is so relatable that the impact that you will make I believe it's huge. Thank you. Thank nice you. to get to know. Thank you. You as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for having me.